Speaking of trials, Sherry's going to have a rough week this week. <laughs> you know, all Jesus followers are red, and we are outnumbered. I will say that. So um, I'm just joking. All right. Hey, uh, I'm just completely distracted, right? <laughs> We're in this series upstream, and um, talking about living upstream in a downstream world. And that if we take the Bible and we apply it to our lives and we really look at what the Bible is saying, that typically it will lead us to live a life that is different than the rest of the world um, would say is normal, right? If you weren't here last week, man, go online. Uh, you can get caught up. Uh, what I shared with you last week is we're looking at the book First Peter. And in First Peter, it's a little book back in the, in the New Testament. It's really short. But if you want to be reading that with me, that's where I'm going to be focusing for the next um, the next several weeks. And so, but the thing about First Peter is you have Peter who's writing to a group of people. Last week we talked about, he calls these people foreigners. He calls them aliens. Um, he calls them exiles. Um, in fact, and then he calls them even temporary residents. People who are living in this world. And what he's saying is you're living in this world, but you're not actually of it. Like you're living for the world to come. Your hope doesn't come from where you find yourselves today your hope comes from your faith in Christ that will carry you from this world to the next. And, and one of the things we know about this group of people is they were facing some really, really like tough stuff. They were being persecuted for their faith. They were scattered all over the place. And one of the things he was saying was, hey, I know it's rough. I know it's hard right now. I know some of you are like literally giving up your life for your faith, but keep holding to the life that you know is true. Keep holding, like keep, keep following Christ no matter what it costs you because it will pay off in the end. So um, now I, I said last week, I don't think probably any of us here um, are following Jesus in the kind of way which is going to cost us our life this week. But I do think that there are people here who are going through difficult, difficult things. And my hope is that um, as we continue to focus on First Peter, that maybe, maybe it can bring some comfort to you. So I'm going to read... Um, we're going to continue right where we left off last week. First Peter chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 6, and we're going to go through 9 today. It says, So be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it'll bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Here's what I would say. Um, so every week, when we gather in this place, it's my hope. Like I want, um, I think when people show up to church that they should get something to take home with them. Like you should get some kind of applicable truth that would make sense in, on your life that you could say, man, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna practice that. I think that's what we should be doing, right? I don't think it's just for, the, for your head. I don't think it's just to go home and think about. I think it's to be lived out. And so my goal every week is that there'd be something that you would take, whether it's from a song, as Kyle mentioned, or whether it's from the message itself. But, but one of the things I felt about this week, and this happens every once in a while, is I hope everyone finds something today. But I believe this. I, I, I'm believing that there are people here today that will be exactly where the scripture is. And I just want to tell you, if that's you, you're not here on accident. You're here on purpose. And, and I hope that what you'll do is open your ears. I was actually praying with someone last night during the service, and, um, and it was amazing how the message lined up with their life for that specific day on, I mean, like yesterday, Saturday. And I said, don't take this as coincidence. Take this as God knows right where you live. And even if you're the only one he's spoken to tonight, may you, may you feel even more so that he loves you and he cares about you in the situation you find yourself in. So before we go any further, let's just pray. Father, thank you. I thank you for every person who's gathered in this room. And I pray that you would take your words and connect it with their hearts. Lord, they take something with them today. I also pray that if there are people here who are hurting, who are going through heavy, heavy trials in their life, 
that, Lord, they would listen in, that they would tune in, and, Lord, you would find ways to encourage and minister to them. I pray that they would know they're not here on accident, but, Lord, they're here on purpose. Man, have your way here today. Help me to choose my words carefully. In Jesus' name, amen. I got a text this week, and um, I'll just tell you what it said. Um, it started like this. What little faith I had is now gone. What little faith I had is now gone. Now, that's the kind of text that, um, you, like, as a pastor, you don't really want to see, right? Um, it's, it's a person who's at a really bad place. And then you ask yourself, right, what do we say to people in the midst of being battered by life circumstances? What could we possibly say to bring hope in that kind of situation? We struggle at times, I'm guessing just as I do, you struggle at times when people are hurting around you to find heard words to say that could possibly bring comforting, could bring help or bring hope to a situation. Oftentimes from my experience, I, I recognize there are no magic words. There's nothing I can say. And, and I think about Peter who's addressing this group of people. I think what he's hoping, right, is that these words that he would share with them would somehow bring comfort, bring hope, bring healing to people who are in a really, really bad place. Now, I just tell you, like, uh, for me, oftentimes when someone comes alongside of me and they're trying to encourage me or they're trying to comfort me, one of the things I want to know is that they've been there, right? I mean, it helps if I just know that they have some sort of sense of feeling what I feel. I think about Peter. Pastor John preached on this several weeks ago. But I think Peter remembers well the pain of falling to temptation, the night he betrayed Jesus in this moment of greatest need. I mean, you want to talk about a low in the days and months ahead. Can you imagine how Peter felt after his denial and Jesus went on to die and, and then the aftermath of the guilt that came with that and, oh, you talk about some low days. And, and so I think what we have here is, is a man who's writing to this group of people who understands where they might feel the way that they do. Um, Let's talk about even verse 6. It says, so be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. I think endure is a word that um, may catch your attention. It caught mine as I was reading this week. When you think about trials and you think about the word endure, like that's an important word. If you were to look up that word and just see the meaning of it, it says this. To put up with something, trying or painful... In fact, the word um, implies the power to sustain without flinching or breaking. That doesn't sound good, does it? It's this idea that when we're in this terrible place, that we would sustain, that we would hold steady without flinching or breaking. How many of you um, across your life have ever had an MRI? Many of you, right? How many of you enjoyed that? right? Isn't that, you know, and it's not like it's painful. It's just, it's, it's weird, isn't it? And I remember the first one I had, and I had it on a, on a knee um, years ago, and they rolled me halfway into that machine, you know, the very tight, uh, feels like a capsule, right? They're getting ready to launch you out of there like a missile or something. And, um, and, and that leg went in, and, you know, they said, oh, you know, lay really, really still, and, and I did, and, and then, you know, and in the recent past, I had to get another MRI. And so when the, the nurse came in to my room and said, hey, we're going to take you down for an MRI, um, would you like something to take the edge off? Like, we can actually make this, like, you know, because it can be a little, it, it bothers some people. I was like, nah, I've had this before. I've had an MRI. I mean, I was being, you know, because I was trying to act all tough, you know. The reality was I didn't want a shot because I thought it's probably what I'm going to get when they say I'm going to relax, right? <laughs> So I thought, I'll avoid the shot because I can do the MRI. And, and the difference this time, though, it wasn't my knee. It was my head. Now, now you're like, oh, it makes perfect sense, right? <laughs> yeah. And so they rolled me into this machine, and, they, you know, they had this thing on my head, and they were holding it steady. And uh, I'll tell you, it was a very different perspective from the knee to the head. And so when I was completely in there, encapsulated, um, I never thought I would be claustrophobic, but oh my. And, and I laid in there, and all of a sudden, the banging and the clanging, and I mean, why does it have to make all that noise, right? 
and it's just screaming at you. And, and this thing lasted for 40 minutes of banging and screaming and clanging. And, and I just, every part of me was like, I just want out, you know? And one of the things I asked them before they wheeled me in, because once I laid on that table and I saw that capsule, it wasn't the same as it was when I was 16, right? It looked a little different. I said, hey, wh what happens if I get in there and I don't like this? And they said, all you got to do is yell. We'll bring you out. We'll give you what you need. And then we'll stick you back in. <laughs> right? And I was like, okay. And so the whole time I was in there, I kept thinking, I mean, I kept feeling like I'm at the threshold. I'm at the threshold. So many times I wanted to yell. Now, I made it. I made it all 40 in minutes, 40 minutes, but I'm telling you, that was enduring, right? That was enduring. Now, now listen to this verse. Now, this is the same verse, but it's, it's from a different version. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may, may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now, I thought it was interesting that in the NIV version, they t chose to use the word grief. See, when, when I think the word grief is used, because I know what grief feels like, grief um, says to me, this is a deep kind of pain. This isn't the kind of pain that at the end of 40 minutes, it will be over, right? See, the thing about the MRI machine was, in 40 minutes, they're going to roll me out. I thought, if I can just make it to 40 minutes, it'll be done. I don't know about you all, but when you're in heavy kinds of pain, Difficult, difficult places of life. Don't you wish there was a timer? They, they, they were like, hey, you know what? This is just a three-day kind of thing. The fourth day when you get up, it'll be all good. Mm -mm. I think what, what Peter is addressing is even in these folks, it's kind of like their life where they find themselves, this isn't like, hey, you know what? It's going to last for three days, folks. Mm -mm. This is a long-suffering kind of pain that he's talking to them about. This is a long-suffering kind of trial. You know, um, even about, I was reminded this, uh, this last week, I was at a gas station. It was actually Casey's here in Ottawa. And I was standing there, you know, you, you pump gas in your car. There's nothing else to do, right? You just, you just stand there and wait. And, it, and, and <laughs> some gas stations, I feel like the pumps are so slow, right? I love, that's when you know you have a patient's problem, right? When, when, you, when you're like, hey, I don't like that gas station because I think it pumps slower. Um, but I was standing there, and it was pumping. I felt like it was taking forever. And I, I looked up, and I saw this gentleman who was also pumping, and he had his back to me. But when I looked, I looked he had on these um, red wing boots, like steel-toed red wing boots. And, and then he had on this pair of jeans, and he had on a short sleeve button-up shirt, and he kind of had tanned arms. He was a little stockier guy with salt and pepper hair. And, uh, and instantly, I was standing there, and time just kind of stopped. And I th and truthfully, when I looked at him, he looked just like my dad. The boots were the same. The jeans were the same. The shirt was the kind that my dad wore. I, I studied him. I looked at his arms, and I thought, man, the, even, even the way that he stood and his belly kind of protruded, <laughs> no kidding. I was like, it looks just like him. And, and I sat there, and I was just so like, I was sad. And part of me didn't want him to turn around because I just kind of wanted to pretend for a moment that that was him. That may sound odd, but it was the reminder, right? It was the reminder that some pains, they don't go away. Some pains, they just continue to linger. Some kinds of trials, you know, and I think about grieving over the loss of my dad, like that will be around for a very, very long time. See, I, but I tell you this, I take comfort in knowing that Jesus understood grief. He understood trials. He understood pain. I think God created us with the capacity to grieve. I'm reminded there's a verse in John chapter 11. I worked all week to memorize it so I could share it with you. And, um, and it's, you know, you, you can work on it this week too. There's John chapter 11. Here's what the verse says. Jesus wept. That's it. So you can get that one, Right? You can get that one. Jesus wept. And, and the idea of that verse is it's in the middle of this story where, where Jesus has lost his really good friend. And he's at the tomb of his friend Lazarus, and Scripture says he wept. It shows us the human side of Jesus, that he felt pain, that he felt the hardship. And here's what I would say. You can't skip over that kind of pain. You can't just will it away. You can't say it's going away tomorrow because I'm going to make it go away. 
In fact, I say to people, man, if you skip over grief, grief, you skip over healing itself. I was talking to a loved one the other day, and they said, I just feel like I should be doing better. They were talking about just some heavy pain in their life. And I said, I don't know that you should use the word should. I think it's okay. You just are where you are. And the fact that you're still hurting so deeply, it just, it just says that God's healing work's not done in your life yet. Now, if we continue, and I'm going to tell you, this is the part of the, I don't really like this part of the sermon, so, um, but just listen to it. If you look at verse 7, hear these words. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. It's the idea of getting the impurities out, right? Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Oftentimes in the messes of life, we're seeking and searching for God's presence in the midst of it. This passage reminds us that God is up to something in the midst of the pain, that he actually has a purpose in the midst of trials. Now, before you go any further, because some of you in your head, I know where you go. God is not the cause. I believe this with all my heart. God is not the cause of your suffering and pain. But I also believe he doesn't waste an opportunity to grow you through it. He uses every trial for our good. In fact, I'm going to read you two verses, and I can't stand either one of them. Is that a good preface, right? <laughs> when your pastor says he doesn't like a couple of scriptures. I don't like them, though, because they're hard. I don't like them because in the midst of some of the lowest points in my life, I didn't want to hear these verses. But listen to them. Romans chapter 8. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And listen to this one. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's this idea that we wouldn't just look for an exit to the pain, that maybe our prayer would be less of like, God, just give me an exit. God, just get me out of this. God, just make it go away. What if, what if we were to pray? And I, I think that's, it's okay for that to be part of the prayer because we're human, right? But what if the other part of the prayer was, and God, make it go away, but if it doesn't, let's not waste it. Why don't you do some refining work in me? Purify my heart in the midst of this difficult spot like fire can purify gold. Because at the end of the day, what I desire, God, is that my faith would be genuine and real. And that it would hold steady under the toughest of life situations. I was actually out with a family not long ago. And um, it's a family that I, I know really well. And their daughter, um, she's, gone through, she's gone through some tough stuff. And, and she was walking by my table. And I just said to her, I said, man, you are doing so well. Like I think about, I think about what I've seen in your life across the last year. And it's amazing. It's amazing what God has done in the midst of this young lady. I, I say it because I remember also when it was a very, very difficult place. But I think about the shaping work that happened in her life in that terrible place. That and now all of a sudden I feel like she's walking out on the other side. And there's evidence. There's evidence that that trial, that that difficult place, that it wasn't wasted. That who she is now is, is, is this better, this godlier young lady because she was refined in the midst of the fire. You know, God, God sometimes, I believe, wants to shape us in the midst of the struggle. Here's what we also know, though, right? Trials have a way... When we're under the fire, trials have a way of showing who we really are, right? They do. When, when we're in terrible places, when we're going through, like, terrible pain, when we're in these rough kinds of spots, I think sometimes we show our true colors. It's a great indicator. How am I really doing, right? You know, just a funny story. I was in, um, so I was... 
I actually went to my small group this last week, right? Any of you doing your summer groups? Man, we had a great time. My, go- my group is a golf group. Can't beat that, right? <laughs> and it was awesome. We were out at Pine Hills and uh, played nine holes. It was beautiful. Um, didn't play well, but it was fun, right? And, um, but in, in the, on the ninth hole, there's, there's this hole with, uh, it's got two huge trees out there, way down there. It's one of my favorite driving holes because it's, it's like a combination of golf and like football, I think, just like hit it right through the uprights, right? It's like a field goal. And, um, and, and man, and it's, you can just step up and you let it go. And that day there was a little wind behind and, and I was standing there and my group's with me and then another two who pulled up to watch. And all of a sudden I was just feeling a little, little pressure, right? And, and I stood there and I thought, oh, I can't wait like to crush this thing, you know? And I reared back and swung. I kept my head down, back my head down so much that I kind of, I lost it. I didn't even see it. And so whack, and I'm looking down the middle. And I mean, I'm waiting for it to split the goalpost, you know, and I hear some giggling behind me. <laughs> and the truth was, it didn't split anything here. It split the fairway over here. <laughs> Straight, right, boom, landed out there in the fairway, you know. Everybody had fun with it except for me, right? <laughs> you see, sometimes pressure does something to us, doesn't it? It does. I mean, sometimes pressure makes us perform well, and sometimes pressure does not, Right? I think about it, though, in, in the midst of life, when we're under pressure, when we've got the fire under our feet, how are we doing? I think faith is one of the key words. It says here in verse 7, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. That's what we hope, right? It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. And then it goes on to say, your faith is more precious than mere gold. Gold, which is like the hottest commodity around, right? Like, I mean, that's what the world would say, like, man, gold. And what he's saying is gold, like, fails in comparison to faith. That at the end of the day, what we want to prove is that our faith is authentic, that our faith is genuine. You know, I, I was thinking as a pastor over years, like I've seen it over and over again, that I encounter people at some of their worst places. I encounter people in emergency rooms, and I encounter people with, you know, funerals. I encounter people with sicknesses. And, and I, I can look back, and I can remember some just terrible stories of being with people at terrible places. And, and even, yeah, I'm not even going to share that. I, here's what I know. For many of those families, my prayers... My, my prayers are for them that God would give them healing, that God would give them hope again, that God would comfort them. But I'll tell you, one of my prayers for families that are at the absolute worst places of life is this. You can see it. You can see that people get to this place and there's a crossroad. It's like they come to a T. They can either turn left to abandon their faith because they see God as the source of the problem. Or they can turn right to embrace their faith because they see God as the source of their healing. Now, I'll tell you, I, I never know which way it's going to go. And I pray for people because I think, and, and oftentimes what you do is you can talk to people even years later. And, and when they've taken that road of abandoning faith, you hear it in them. You hear a bitterness. You hear an anger with God. You hear... Man, let me tell you when. Six years ago when this happened, this is what God did for me. It was, there was a crossroad. See, and, and then when I think about faith proving genuine, what does that mean? Does that mean more effort? Does that mean like, hey, I'm going to put on a good face? Does that mean I'm going to do everything I can to present well? No. Faith that is genuine is really just about dependence. If you look... In fact, I'm going to just pull it up here. I was reading and I thought of it a minute ago. Verse 9, listen to this. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. That really what we're talking about at the end of the day, what we want our faith to be genuine, when, when we want that to occur, the way in which that measure is measured is, did we put our trust in him? Not just in the best of moments, but in the worst of moments. Did we abandon 
or did we embrace? Because I think what God desires is that we would hang on to him. That we would press into him. And, and maybe that even we would pray, God, I want this to be over. Let's, let's pray honestly, right? But don't waste it. Don't waste this trial in my life to do the work that you need to do in me. To purify me. To do a refining work that on the other end of this, I come out more dependent upon you than I was before I went in. Would you pray with me? Father, I give you thanks today. I'm thankful that you walk with us, man, through all kinds of things. I recognize in this room today there are people here who are struggling with all kinds of stuff that I don't even have a clue of. I pray that they would hear your encouragement this morning. May they know that, God, you know where they live and you know what's going on and you know the details. I pray that you would remind them Lord, this is not a time to walk away from you. This is a time to press into you. That you would walk with them. That you would refine them. Oh, that you would help them. That you would give them hope and healing. God, I trust that you can do that today. I trust that you can do it today. And I pray that if there, even there are people who are at the crossroads, that God, they would choose you today. I pray that if there are people who maybe chose a crossroad long ago, which was walking away from you today, they might reconsider. That they would know that all they have to do is just turn towards you, and you are there inviting our return. God, I give you thanks today in Jesus' name. Amen.